everyone, I'm Rachel from Wild Backyard Soaps. I wanted to share a beginner soap making lesson with you today. I haven't done one of these in a while, just to show you all the little details of what you need to know before you get started making your own soap. It's not as hard as you think, but there are a lot of little things to think about and some equipment you need to get and some techniques just to make sure you're doing everything safely. Now, there's a lot of different ways to make soap. This is the way I like to do it. I would suggest watching some other videos as well before you try your own. There's a lot of different recipes that you can do and some different techniques of how to add the lye to the oils. So yeah, just letting you know that as a disclaimer and make sure you know proper lye safety before you attempt any soap making projects as well. First thing I like to do is choose a recipe and make sure I have all the ingredients and equipment that I need. I usually write my recipe on a note card and I go to soapcalc.net. There's some other calculators out there for calculating soap recipes, but you want to make sure you have the proper amount of lye for the oils that you're using. Now it can be oils, butters, waxes, all of those are fats. Now lye or sodium hydroxide turns fats into soap. It saponifies them. That's the technical word for it, which is pretty cool. But you need to make sure that you're using the correct amount of lye to turn all of your fats into soap with just a little bit left over for moisture, but you don't want a mushy bar and you don't want lye left over in your bar because that will burn you. It's very caustic. So using a soap calculator will ensure that you're using the proper amount of lye for the amount of oils that you have to make sure that your bar is safe and perfect. I have a separate video on how to calculate your own recipes using soap calc. I would highly recommend watching that so you understand more of the science behind how the calculator works to make sure that you're using it properly. But let's just say that you found a recipe that you liked, you plugged it into soap calc, you wrote it all down, you know how many ounces or grams of each oil you need, you know how much lye you need for all of your oils in order to saponify all of them. Now that I have my recipe, I'm going to go ahead and measure out my lye. So this is the biggest thing that scares a lot of people about soap making is handling a strong base. I don't want to get burned, etc. It's okay. You'll be fine. But make sure you're in a distraction free area that is well ventilated. So crack your window, go work on your kitchen counter somewhere like that. And then proper eye safety and closed toed shoes, not like dress flats. You don't want any part of your foot exposed. And then you can use some heavy duty gloves like these, or you could use something a little bit lighter weight like these. I'm just gonna go ahead and do this. Once I get into the soap making process, I'll switch to the lighter gloves just so I have a little more dexterity, but this is how I like to start. And then I use some ice cubes for a majority of my distilled water because it cuts down on the fumes because this is an exothermic reaction. When you add lye to water, it heats up very fast. It can get up to like 180 plus degrees. So you want to make sure you have a heat resistant container that's not going to crack or melt or react with the lye. So you want to have a dedicated spoon and container specifically for using lye that you don't use for anything else, just in case it gets stuck in some of the cracks. So I'm going to turn on the scale and you want to make sure your scale is calibrated properly. You want to check it about once a year and having a scale that can go to two decimal places is ideal, but at least one, something that's going to be pretty accurate. And for my recipe, I'm doing Lang Lang and lavender today. I need 7.5 ounces of distilled water. So I'm not doing a very big batch. I just wanted one soap loaf today. So this is what I'm using. This is about 44 ounces, but I'm going to do about 42 ounces today just so it's not quite to the top because I want to be able to cover it. All right, so I'm almost to seven and a half. I'm going to add just a little bit of liquid just to help the lye slosh around in there and get dissolved quicker. Okay, there we go. I'm going to set this aside and I like to use this so that the lye doesn't splatter on the table because it comes in little granules. If you've got any on the table, just make sure you wipe everything down with some wet paper towel, use gloves. You can use vinegar to wipe it down as well. If you ever accidentally get lye on yourself, make sure that you rinse, rinse, rinse. Okay. I'm just using an old lye container that's empty because then the lye doesn't stick inside of it as well. All right. I'm going to give this a shake to make sure that everything is not clumpy. So for this recipe, it calculated 4.42 ounces of lye. Okay. 
Okay, I have my 4.42 ounces of lye. Now this is a big safety thing right here. You never pour water into lye. That is bad. You pour lye into the water. Let me get this out of the way so you can see. And I'll sometimes set my container back on here and make sure it's still zero afterwards. So then I know for sure it all got in there. Just stir it up until everything's dissolved. And then you can set that aside to cool down. It'll melt down these ice cubes pretty fast. Now, when you're getting into more advanced recipes, you can swap out part of the water for some different kinds of milk or tea or coffee. And you could freeze those as cubes and mix it in right with the lye. But since it can get hot, if you don't want it to burn, some people will do part of the liquid and mix it in with the oils. So that way the lye doesn't react with that part until later. But you still always have to have at least one-to-one -one water to lye when you're dissolving the lye to start with. Okay, so that is all mostly dissolved. So I'm just going to set this aside to cool down a little bit. If you want, once this is cooled down some... What I'm gonna do is add in some sodium lactate, just a couple teaspoons, like a teaspoon per pound of oils from, for your recipe, and that helps harden the bar. So I'm gonna set this aside by my window so it's out of the way, won't get bumped and knocked over. Now the next step is to measure out all of your oils. I'll put the recipe plus another couple recipe ideas in the description box below. I like to go palm free and I usually like to stick with all natural soaps and just use natural botanicals and colorants sourced from the earth or plants and then essential oils. But you can do fragrance oils, you can do mica powders, that's fine too. So a little bit of creativity here, which is fun. So I'm using olive oil, coconut oil, shea, cocoa, avocado, and castor. Each of them has their own properties that contributes to this. If you want to learn more about the properties of oils, I have a good couple websites that I found on the internet that explain all the different properties of oils with charts, how they help the soap behave, what percentages are safe to use. So I will share that with you in the description. Whatever container that you're using to measure out your oils, just make sure that it has a nice pour spout and handle on it and that it's big enough that it can handle all of your liquids plus your oils plus some room to spare. And you want to make sure that you're only using glass, ceramic, or properly rated plastic or stainless steel, but not any aluminum because aluminum can react with the lye. So I'm just going to speed through this part while I'm measuring out all the oils, but basically you just pour it in the bowl, hit tear to make it go to zero again, get the next one in, hit tear, get to zero again, Etc. So I'll speed through that. Um, but I do like for some of the harder stuff like shea, coconut, cocoa, which I have in my double boiler right here, I like to kind of melt them down some first because it makes it easier to scoop rather than having to like really scrape through it to measure out what you need. So I like to melt them down just a little bit and then pour them in. And then everything's already more or less melted and then you just put it in your double boiler until you get it up to a good temperature. For your oils and your lye, you want both of them to be anywhere from about 95 degrees to like 120 degrees and then within 10 degrees of each other is ideal. You don't have to do it that way but it's it's better and then it's a little bit safer to work with in my opinion so that's how I like to do it and then depending on what you're doing having a slightly cooler temperature closer to like the 100 degrees is better if you need more time to work with it because otherwise it can start to thicken up quicker if you're trying to do something a little bit more complex. opinion because this is where your creativity and your preferences get to come in. You get to choose which fragrances and which colors and designs you want to do. Now I'm just going to do a really simple one today just to get started for you guys and this is going to be scented with Lang Lang and Lavender essential oils and then 
I'm going to use a little bit of this indigo powder in with the oils to give it more of like a purplish grayish color and then top it with some jasmine flowers and a little bit of lavender buds. And that is it. For the fragrance or essential oils though, this is important, you need to look up an essential oil calculator online. It will give you some different blends that you can try, but also let you know what a safe amount of essential oils or fragrance oils is to use. And they measure it per pound of oils. So that's how I look that up. And you just wanna make sure that it's safe. You don't want it to be too weak of a smell or too strong of a smell, but you can have your preference. I prefer a little bit stronger smell. So I just put my jar on my scale and zeroed it out. And then I poured in until I got two ounces of essential oils between my Lang Lang and my lavender. Now Lang Lang is pretty expensive. So I only did about one part Lang Lang to two parts lavender for this recipe. If you want to make your own blend and you're not going to follow a blend that somebody else suggested online, I would highly recommend just getting like a little paper towel and do like one drop of one of them, maybe two drops of a different one. Kind of, you want to figure out your ratio, but just do drops on a paper towel and smell it that way to find out if that's the correct ratio and if you like those together before you waste mixing a larger amount of them together in a jar. Most commonly for soap molds, people will use a silicone mold. So you could do a loaf shape like a rectangular one you could get a much smaller than this if you're just doing this for personal or if you're doing a bigger batch to sell or for gifts you can do this or even a longer one i have longer ones too or you could do a round one depending on the design and your preference these don't stand up as nicely uh they want to roll so but if you're just laying it down on a soap tray that totally works fine so yeah that's just a couple different ideas or you could even make your own custom mold out of plastic or out of some wood and then you would line it with freezer paper so if you want to know how to line your soap mold with freezer paper i do have a short separate video on that that you can check out in my soap making playlist as well while i'm waiting for everything to finish getting to the right temperature i wanted to talk about a couple of other equipment ideas that you might want so this is a infrared thermometer very helpful for when you need to take your temperatures so that we are not having to stick it in and keep wiping it off. So right now my oils, I let them sit in here a little too long. I was doing something else and got distracted and this is at 131 right now. So I need to let this cool down probably about 20 degrees. And then because we had so much ice cubes in this lye solution, I'm putting it back just in this water. I have the burner turned off. It's just sitting in the warm water to warm it up a little bit it was at like 88. So now it's at 97. So I want to get both of these to be probably about 110. Like I said, having it at a cooler temperature gives you more time to work with it because it doesn't thicken up as quickly. And you don't want to run the risk because once you combine the lye with the oils, it does another exothermic reaction and that heats it up again. And you don't want it to get so hot where it makes the top crack a little bit. Another special piece of equipment that you might want that will make your life much easier when soap making is a stick blender or immersion blender. These things are not that expensive, thankfully. I think this was like maybe 30 some dollars, but mixing the lye solution with the oils, you have to really get it mixed well to make sure that it fully reacts and saponifies all of it. And you don't leave any patches left behind that didn't react fully. So this just speeds up the process a lot. You could hand mix, but it would take a very, 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 very long time. So this speeds it up quite a bit. Now, the one thing I will warn though, you just have to be careful not to stick blend too much. Do like five, 10 seconds at a time and then just swirl it around, five, 10 seconds, swirl it around. That way you're not accidentally over mixing and getting it thicker than you want it to before you have a chance to work with it. Because if you're doing some layers or if you wanna do like a fun hanger swirl, things like that, you need a little more time. So that's just one tip that I like to warn about that is very common mistake and I've been guilty of it many times as well. Because this is just a simple one layer soap, we're not pulling off part of it to add any other colors to, I'm going to go ahead and add this indigo powder in with the oils so it can infuse just a little bit while it's hotter. And this will give it that nice purplish gray color. Now, depending on the oils that you use, if you have some more yellowish oils, it can turn it more gray. Or depending on what other colors, it can even turn more of like a greenish color. Even hemp oil, for example, if you wanted to do like my cucumber mojito soap, you would want to use some greener oils and then maybe some French green clay, some mint leaves just for fun. Or you might want to do like more of a rose or floral soap with some French pink clay. And another really popular one is 
lavender oats and honey or lemon oats and honey so either of those essential oils with your recipe but then you can put in a couple teaspoons of honey which helps boost the lather and you could put in some colloidal oat powder or just take some oats and blend them up nice and fine in your food processor and add those in as well there's a lot of natural botanicals plant materials clays that you can use for your soaps if you're wanting to stray away from more synthetic ingredients like mica powders and fragrance oils, things like that, titanium dioxide. So I know that's kind of a touchy subject in the soap making world of whether to consider those natural or not. I try to avoid them if I can just because they don't really disclose what all is in it. I do have a separate video that I'm making explaining more in detail about essential oils versus fragrance oils. And just, if you do like fragrance oils, some of the different ones you could try that I have tried that have worked well so far. One more thing I will mention, it's nice to keep some paper towels in a trash can nearby just in case you spill. It happens, we're all human. <laughs> I'm gonna take the temperature one more time, but it's pretty cool in my basement, so I think we're about ready to get started here. This says 108. And this is 117. So we're kind of in that range and they're both within 10 degrees of each other so I think we can go ahead and get started. So I always like to do a quick mental check and make sure I have everything all set here. So I have my toppers ready to go, the jasmine and lavender petals, and then I've got my lavender and Lang Lang essential oil blend ready to add. So this is my oils, this is my lye solution, and then it's a little darker purple because of adding that indigo. So I'm gonna go ahead and suit up for safety. And then you might have seen me do this a time or two in my other videos. I always do that even though it looks ridiculous as a reminder to be safe. <laughs> so I'm gonna bring the camera closer so you can see what this looks like as I'm mixing. Okay, we are ready. I'm gonna give this one last little swirl. Some people will use like a little strainer when they're pouring this just in case there's some little lye chunks left over, but I can look right in here and usually tell that there's there's no chunks at all, so it's totally fine. And I like to set this aside and save it for later for scraping out the bowl at the end. All right, so let's go ahead and add our lye solution into the oils. And I set this aside so I can rinse it later. Now this is the fun part. You might not be able to tell because this indigo is a little bit darker, but blending this up and you can start to see it saponify and it does like a cool little swirl design. <laughs> I want to lighten this up a little bit. I like to add kale and clay or different clays to a lot of my soaps. They're really good for the skin. It, I feel like it's nice and smooth and moisturizing. It can help absorb impurities and scrub a little bit. So about a tablespoon per pound of oils is fine. I'm just going to do that. Some people will disperse their colors or their clays with a little bit of oil or water before mixing it together just so it mixes better and doesn't get all clumpy. But this was an afterthought, so <laughs> I didn't do that. I could have mixed it in with the oils and stick blended it ahead of time, but this is fine too. You just don't want to over mix and get it to be too thick, but this will be okay. So we are about at trace right now. It's a little bit when you can start to somewhat see a design before it falls back in. It's very, very thin. So we're going to mix this up a little bit more first. All right, as you can see, everything is completely mixed. There's no just oils left over. And you can pull your stick blender out and check. And if there's no clumps, I mean, ignore the clays, but if you see no clumps and it looks like it's actually 
all mixed, you won't see any oil chunks left over. It will be completely emulsified and to trace. So if I do this, I can see a pattern in the bowl and it's still pretty thin, but this is mixed enough that if you wanted to split this off into different pouring pitchers to add some colors, you could at this point. But I'm just going to do a simple pour. Now, once you're at trace, this is when you add in most of your colorants or your fragrances. So I'm going to go ahead and add in my oils. Now, this is a floral and florals can sometimes speed up trace and get it to be pretty thick, pretty quick. Usually lavender isn't too bad, and I did a batch of Lang Lang the other day. It wasn't too bad either. I'm just gonna blend this a little bit more and then we'll go ahead and pour it into our mold. Now the idea here is low and slow because you can see there's get some air bubbles in it from mixing it and usually just start in one spot and let it spread its way across. And then of course scrape out every last little bit of goodness. And then do that a few times to get out any air bubbles. If it gets too thick, the air bubbles won't come out. So you want to tab it before it gets too thick. Now, since I want to do a fun little design on the top of this, I'm just going to use a spatula, but I need it to thicken up a little bit. So I'm going to test it right now. It's, it's starting to thicken up, actually. That's not too bad. If you have a nice thin spatula, that would be fun too. This one is a little bit thick for what I'm trying to do right now. Yeah, it looks a little weird. I'm going to keep playing with it here for a second. Now, if you were going to do a hanger swirl, if you had added in a few different colors, you would just take it in, swoop, 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 and pull it back out. So once you're a little bit you got a few batches under your belt, then you could try something like that. So I, I like this for the most part. So I'm going to turn this over and do like a little swoop de swirl to smooth that out. There. That looks good. For a nice simple start. So now let's sprinkle on some of these flowers. I'll start with the jasmine. The tricky part is getting them to stick and stay on here and not fall off later. And because it's mostly saponified, it is safe at this point if you wanted to take your gloves off if you need more dexterity for what you're doing. So at this point, the patience begins. You have to wait about 48 hours at least for this to harden up enough before you can remove it from the mold. Silicone molds tend to take a little bit longer, but if you use sodium lactate, that helps harden it up quicker so you can unmold faster. But it's okay if you wait an extra day or two or if you're not sure and you wanna make sure it's not mushy so you don't damage it. But let this sit and if you want it to gel or make the colors pop, you can cover this and insulate it like put a blanket over it or even put it on a heating pad or you could heat up the oven to the lowest setting and then pop this in and turn the oven off and just let it sit in there overnight and that can help make the colors pop so that's called forcing gel phase and then another thing that a lot of people will do is spray it with some isopropyl alcohol i usually do this that just forms a temporary layer on top to help prevent that soda ash that I was talking about, where any lye that's on the surface here could react with the carbon dioxide in the air and then just make that white powdery stuff. And if we wanna prevent that, spraying it is nice. And because this didn't come all the way up to the top, I'm additionally gonna put a little bit of cardboard over top and then I'm just gonna put a blanket over it. So we'll come back in about 48 hours and unmold and I'll show you how to cut this and tell you what to do next. One more thing I forgot to mention. After you're done making the soap, 
you can let your equipment sit because all of this just turns into soap and it's really easy to rinse off or you can rinse it off right away. I would recommend rinsing the stick blender right away so that way the blade doesn't get stuck or anything. Super easy because it's just soap. That's what I love about this process. It's not too bad for the cleanup. Okay, it's now been 48 hours, so let's see if this is ready to unmold. Looks pretty good to me. That lightened up nicely, just how I wanted. So just kind of like a grayish purple color. I think it matches with these flowers nicely. So this is one of my favorite parts, is actually cutting the soap. You can just use a kitchen knife. Something thin and sharp is ideal because if this is a little tacky, it'll kind of stick to the knife just a little bit. And then one tip, the top, if you have any kind of botanicals or anything on the top at all, you're going to want to turn the soap sideways when you're cutting it. So that way it doesn't drag any of these pieces through the whole soap and leave any marks. Now, one thing that makes it kind of cleaned up a little bit before you slice, I like to take a vegetable peeler and just go around the edge real quick. It's like so satisfying to do. <laughs> it's fun to watch too. It's not gonna do much on this side. All right, I think this soap loaf is ready to be cut. You will wanna clean off your string every few slices as well. like it did gel all the way through. It actually turned out really nice. Now if you want to take a vegetable peeler and clean up around the sides you can, but because this is still a little soft, as you can see this is the edge, I like to wait several weeks or to wait until it's fully cured before I do any more trimming on it. out so beautifully. So the hardest part now is that you need to let these cure for four to six weeks in a cool, dark, well-ventilated area so they can dry out. That just helps harden them up so that way they'll last longer. Technically, you could use it right away, but it's going to be a little bit mushy. And I wanted to let you know as a thank you for making it all the way through this video with me today, I'm offering you a 20% off coupon code to my Etsy shop if you'd like to get yourself anything. And this coupon code is gonna be valid until I say it's not, so check the description box below. And all you need to do in order to get that is leave me a comment. Say hi, ask a question, let me know your favorite soap smells or designs, I'm always looking for new ideas, and then send me an email, wildbackyardsoaps at gmail.com, and just let me know, hey, I commented on your beginner essential oil soap making lesson, can I have the coupon code? And I will respond back and let you know what it is. So thank you again for joining me, I hope you found this super helpful. And now that you know the basics of soap making, you've just opened up a whole new world of opportunities. So you can check out my other fun soap making demos if you're looking for ideas or if you just want to watch for fun. Don't forget to subscribe and I will see you in the next one very soon.